Okay, so we have uh, two speakers uh, here with us today. Um, Darren Gary Birkland and Tucci Cutlu. Um, Darren is having some temperamental internet issue issues, so he was going to be our first uh, speaker. Um, however, um, we're going to give him 20 minutes to kind of fix things up. So instead, um, we are going to uh, flip the script, uh, given that uh, Tucci is talking about time um, <laughs> as not being continual. I was, so it makes I sense was ready for this. I was ready for this. <laughs> <laughs> you knew this was going to happen, right? Um, yeah, of course I did. <laughs> um, okay, so uh, Tucci getting your name wrong already, Tucci Cutlew completed her undergraduate education in radio, television and film as a, valedict as a valedictorian at Ankara University, received another BA in international relations from Anadolu University. She completed her MA in film studies at uh, University College London under a scholarship, wrote her dissertation on grief in the 21st century horror films, supervised by Professor Suzanne Cord at UCL and was awarded a distinction um, she has finished her second MA on power relations in post-2000 Turkish cinema at Ankara University. And that is where she has recently started her PhD research. Um, her paper today is entitled Here and Now, Happy Death Day and Happy Death Day to You, in which I will hand over to you. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Daniel. Uh, let me start by hopefully um, correctly doing this uh, sharing thing. Uh, let's see. Yep. It's sharing something, definitely. Okay. <clears throat> First of all, I'd like to thank the producers of Happy Death Day for giving us the smash hit that is, it's my birthday. Secondly, I want to thank the organizers of the conference, Daniel and Vikim, for giving me space to talk about my research into Happy Death Day franchise and Falter Benjamin. When I first heard of this conference, I felt that this was going to be amazing and I was not wrong. When um, the only good thing about the pandemic is that we are now able to attend conferences that we couldn't have before. For those of you who haven't watched the films, they are about a young woman who keeps getting murdered and waking up again. Safe to say, it's not your typical Tuesday. Um, maybe it is, I wouldn't like to assume. Um, now that you know the basics, uh, let's kill some people over and over again. And by that I mean talking about Falter Benjamin. A very early article, The Life of Students in 1915, Benjamin rejects a view of history that puts this faith in the infinite extent of time and thus concerns itself only with the speed or lack of it, with which people and epochs advance along the path of progress and contrast this with a perspective in which history appears to be concentrated on a single focal point. Like those that had traditionally been found in the utopian images of the philosophers. The latter messianic view of history has a distinct intention and methodology. It aims to grasp how elements of what Benjamin calls the ultimate condition and highest metaphysical state of history, which we might call the historical absolute, appear not as a telos or end of history, but as an imminent state of perfection, which has the potential to manifest itself in any particular moment. And his messianic view of history is why 
Benjamin's theory is connected to time loop films. Happy that they franchise, particularly because there is literally a device in the second film that causes the loop. In the app and flow of its changing rhythms, additions, revisions, reformulations, and retrievals, Benjamin's Arcades project provides an extraordinary case study in the labor of conceptual construction via the configuration and reconfiguration of archival materials. The founding problematic of Benjamin's thought, the expansion of the Kantian concept of experience to infinity is thus here provided with a concretely historical context in which the notion of infinity, absoluteness, becomes associated with the concept of history itself. The problem to dialectic, dialectically redeem the concept of experience by finding an appropriate way of experiences the crisis of experience itself. In classically modern terms, the present is defined as a time of crisis and transition. And philosophical experience, truth, is associated with the glimpse within the present via the past of a utopian political future that would bring history to an end. For Tree, in Happy Death Day, the present is a continuous crisis that she can't get out of. While we are at it, let's talk a little bit about linear time versus now time, yet sight. Linear time is a time as we understand it. Flowing in a straight way, the introduction of the clock allowed those past generation who adopted this mode of standardization to generalize forms of production to measure time in more exact ways, offering the possibility to unify schedules, geographic scales, and calendars. The unification of calendars is a clear example of the unification of conceptions of time into a unique conception of linear time. However, Benjamin introduces the messianic element to critique such a bourgeois linear conception of time. The messianic element that Benjamin introduced with, the perspect, with respect to time was to find new epistemological dimensions that are capable of establishing new, form, uh, new relations with the world and nature, and which would have a deep impact in developing new forms of so social socialization. For example, Benjamin says that there exists a weak messianic force in every generation of human beings that recognizes in the past the necessity of redemption and the potential of actualizing the past in the present. In Happy Death Day films, the protagonist, Tree, lives the same day over and over again, only to be killed each time. She breaks through the time-space continuum. I argue that it is because her weak messianic force comes from her grief. She is not a bad person to be changed. She is just going through a lot, and this event is her redemption. A new philosophy of historical time is the ultimate goal of Benjamin's later writings. It appears most ex explicitly under construction in Convolute N of the Arcade Project, on the theory of knowledge, theory of progress. It is applied to art history in the 1937 essay, Eduard Fuch, Collector and Historian, and is manifest in a condensed, rhetorically political and problematic form in On the Concept of History. It derives from a dual critique of the vulgar naturalism of historicism and the deferral of action involved in the associated social democratic concept of progress. It gives rise to a conception of historical intelligibility based on literary montage as the method of construction of dialectical images. And it culminates 
in a quasi-messianic conception of revolution as an interruption of history or an arrest of happening. History is interrupted over and over again in Happy Death Day franchise, while she deals with multiple deaths, Tree also deals with her own history. She needs to revolutionize in order to survive and move on. Benjamin writes, and I quote, it is not that what is past casts this light on, the, on what is present, or what is present is light on what is past. Rather, an image is that wherein what has been comes together in a flash with the now to form a constellation. In other words, image is dialectics at a standstill. For while the relation of the present to the past is purely temporal, the relation of what has been to the now is dialectical, not temporal in nature, but figural. Only dialectical images are genuinely historical. The experimental method of montage borrowed from surrealism was to be the means of production of historical intelligibility. Furthermore, the static temporality of the image was understood to connect such an experience of historical meaning directly to a radical or revolutionary concept of action associated with the idea of the present as crisis. The passage goes, the image that is read, which is to say the image in the now of its recognizability bears to the highest degree to the, the imprint of the perilous critical moment on which all reading is founded. Such perilous critical moments are both imminent to the temporality of modernity at a structural level, the temporality of crisis, and in each particular case, contingent and conjecturally specific. In them, the past is understood to bring the present into a critical state. However, this critical state is not a crisis of the status quo, but rather of its destruction. The critical moment is that in which the status quo threatens to be preserved. Dialectical images counter the threat of preservation tradition by virtue of the interruptive force they, they are understood to impart to experience as a consequence of the instantaneous temporality of the now, or what Benjamin famously called now time, yet sight. The dialectical image is an image that emerges suddenly in a flash. It is this image of the image as a flash and the corresponding image of historical experience as the discharge of an explosive force, the explosive force of now time, blasting open the continuum of history, for which Benjamin is probably best known. The philosophy of historical time, which these images sum up, was elaborated by him in two main contexts, the development of a new conception of cultural history and political diagnosis of the historical crisis of Europe at the, at the outset of the Second World War. The destruction of the status quo is what Happy Death Day franchise also does. It destroys and rebuilds again and again. The explosive force of now time blasts open the continuum of history. Benjamin writes, and I quote, history is the object of a construction whose place is formed not in an homogeneous and empty time, but in that which is fulfilled by the here and now, yet died. For Robespierre, Roman antiquity was a past charged with the here and now which he exploded out of the continuum of history. The French Revolution thought of itself as a latter day Rome. It cited ancient Rome exactly the way fashion cites a past costume. Fashion has an eye for what is up to date, wherever it moves in the jungle of what was. It is the tiger's leap into that which has gone before. Only it takes place in an arena in which the ruling classes are in control. The same leap into the open sky of history is a dialectical one, 
as Marx conceptualized the revolution. The consciousness of exploding the continuum of history is peculiar to the revolutionary classes in the moment of their action. The Great Revolution introduced a new calendar. The day on which the calendar started functioned as a historical time-lapse camera. And it is fundamentally the same day which in the shape of holidays and memorials always returns. The calendar does not therefore count time like clocks. They are monuments of a historical awareness of which there has not seem to be the slightest trace for a hundred years. Calendars have a big role in Happy That Day and other time loop films as they are there to make the audience and the characters aware of the circumstances. Walter Benjamin uses, uses Jetzzeit in his thesis on the philosophy of history to describe a notion of time that is ripe with revolutionary possibility time that has been detached from the continuum of history. It is naturally occurring, however, and takes the intervention of the artist or revolutionary to produce it it's by blasting it free. Benjamin contrasts Jetzzeit with the homogeneous empty time of the ruling class, which is history written from the perspective of victors. The moment of messianic arrest is something intelligible in the complex of events that constitute now time or yet sight, something readable to the historian or the poet. As well, the expressions of this moment and elaborations from it, as history or literature are themselves arrests, moments where the progress of time is interrupted in order that the messianic moment the possibility of understanding or even deliverance from suffering is presented. Now you might, you might ask yourself, where the hell Happy Dead Day fits into this? The time loop, I defend, is yet sight, the now time. Because it is time at a standstill, poised, filled with energy, and ready to take what Benjamin called the tiger's leap into the future. Just like Tree, our main character, Benjamin was an outsider. Tree lost her mom and that was her moment of truth. That was the trauma she could not face. Guest sight isn't naturally occurring, however, and takes the intervention of the artist or revolutionary to produce it, it by blasting it free from the ceaseless flow in which it would otherwise be trapped and that's what we learned in the sequel. There was a reason for these time loops. The time loop or temporal loop is a plot device in fiction whereby characters re-experience a span of time which is repeated sometimes more than once with some hope of breaking out of the cycle of repetition. The term time loop is sometimes used to refer to a causal loop, however, Causal loops are unchanging and self-originating, whereas time loops are constantly resetting. When a certain condition is met, such as the death of a character in our case, or a clock reaching a certain time, the loop starts again, possibly with one or more characters retaining the memories from the period, previous loop. And in our case, it's just three remembering the time loop. Stories with time loops commonly uh, center on the character learning from each successive loop through time. Jeremy Douglas, Janet Murray, Noah Falstein, others and others compare time loops with video games and other interactive media where a character in a loop learns about their environment more and more with each passing loop. And the loop ends with complete mastery of the character's environment. Shayla Garcia Catalan provides a similar analysis, saying that the usual way for the protagonist out of a time loop is acquiring knowledge, using retained memories to progress and eventually exit the loop. The time loop is then a problem solving process, the narrative become, becomes akin 
to an interactive puzzle. In Happy Death Day franchise, Tree is over and over getting murdered by some psychos. She learns, she adapts, and she's revolutionary for it. As a grief scholar, as well as a horror scholar, I can't help but talk a little bit uh, about Tree's grief over her mom. She lives through all stages of Kubler-Ross and Kessler's five stages of grief. Denial, anger, bargaining, depression, and acceptance. It takes all her strength and multiple deaths for her to face up to her trauma. She meets her dad and talks about her mom for the first time. This is vital because this is the exploding point of her history. She destroys the status quo, as Walter Benjamin would say. The work of memory collapses time, he retorts. In Tree's case, her memory about her mourning disintegrates time and blasts her free. In the sequel, it's her friends that are dying. She goes through grief again and again until she makes a decision to be the one who dies. Once again, grief is present in the weak messianic power of Tree. In the opening titles, the famous universal opening sequence stops and rewinds. Bear in mind, it is the world turning and stopping, just like the time and space where history takes place. The moment when the film begins over and over again is when she wakes up on her actual birthday. It is no coincidence, because this is a time she used to have good memories about, but now all is different as her mom is not there anymore. She feels as homeless as Benjamin. Benjamin's constant intellectual outsiderness is a major element of this messianic moment. His lack of a systematic or coherent home within a system of ideas is both consciousness and potential for action. Further, Benjamin often expresses this homelessness in terms of shock. Her trauma, her shock, pushes Tree into action. The messianic moment, the loop, sets her free. On a final note, both of these films were directed by Christopher Landon, a queer filmmaker. I personally am very interested in queer filmmaking in horror, And as a person who also loved Freaky, I can't wait to write about queer horror filmmakers in the near future and most definitely include Landon. Thank you for listening. I'm looking forward to the questions. I hope that this study opens up exciting discussions. Try not to get into a murderous groundhog day. Thank you so much. Uh, That was such a spectacular paper, one um, that perfectly gets us going. I think that Darren now has a... Oh, sorry. I believe that Darren now has a stable internet connection, or so we hope. Let's hope for the best. (laughs) We'll we'll find out the hard way, am I right? Um, Okay, so... uh, Darren Gary Birkland is a PhD candidate and digital media lecturer at Coventry University UK. Their research is conducted under Coventry University's Centre for Post-Digital Cultures and focuses on the conditioning of gestures through the possible arrangements and organisations provided by increasingly ubiquitous digital assemblages. Um, Their recent publications include Selfie Screen Sphere, Examining the Selfie as a Complex Embodying Gesture, the Nexus, and Gestural Translations from Within um, gestural translations from within the post digital, a Flusserian analysis of phonic gestures for the Flusser archives. Um, his paper today, which I nearly did not read out, is called, you mean I have to live the rest of my life in this body? I wish I could do it like Chucky, but I can't. (laughs) Examining the slasher genre through the gestural performance of an audience. So uh, Darren, over to you. 
Uh, thank you so much for that wonderful introduction. Um, it's absolutely lovely to be here, um, especially at the end of this wonderful conference. Um, I'm just going to do the awkward try and share my screen. So just give me a brief second here. Um, if someone could just let me know if they could see the PowerPoint. It's all good. OK, brilliant. All right, um, OK, to begin. Um, Two participants were watching Adam Green's 2006 film, Hatchet, on the 25th of August, 2020. Locked down during the pandemic, the participants were watching the film at two separate locations, 7,000 miles apart, while discussing the film across the WhatsApp platform. In the final moments of the film, the characters of Mary Beth and Ben are about to escape the killer. They jump into a small canoe and push it out into the swamp. There are five minutes left in the film's brief runtime, but any fan of the genre knows what is about to happen. The film's killer voheezes himself out of the water, grabbing Mary Beth, throwing her into the swamp. She is drowning and panicking, indicated by fast and unfocused edits. But suddenly, respite. The arm of Ben reaches into the swamp and Mary Beth grabs it to be hoisted out. But there is no hope. This arm has been amputated by the killer who has found themselves in the boat. Mary Beth and the killer scream at one another, and then the film cuts to credits. A variety of exclamations were shared across WhatsApp with mobile phones grasped and at their ready in hand. The surprise ending was referred to as wonderful by one of the participants. Participant 2 said, it definitely requires 59 slasher movies before it. To which participant 1 wrote, yeah, a lot of references but it got the deaths right, to which participant two responded, of course, and this is more or less why we watch. Hatchet and its sequels are films that could colloquially be referred to as love letters to the slasher genre, indicated in the, in the casting of actors such as Elm Street's Robert England, Candyman's Tony Todd, and Kane Hodder, who played Jason in several of the Friday the 13th films. It is replete with set pieces and signifies indicative of this mode of film, gory deaths, at times exploitative nudity, and that defining key elements, that unseen presence of the stalker, the ensuing suspense which is caused by not knowing where the monster is or when the murderer will strike, as Wells reminds us. Slashers are undoubtedly genre films, and as Langford reminds us, genre remains a critical framework for contending with how films are produced and consumed as well as their broader relations to culture and society. However, defining the properties, outlines, and dimensions of genre, as this conference has shown, is often a troubling and at times a poor task. So what this research I am presenting, the research in this paper, provides some preliminary investigations into how genre is assembled through the performance of an audience at the level of gesture. Gesture here, however, not defined as a symbolic movement of the body, but as a situated and performative act of perceptual embodiment, gesture as disposition. In other words, genre is shown to be defined through the gesture of watching and not exclusively how a film is categorized by salient and recognizable characteristics or structures and apparatuses of production. This research evidences this claim through the method of conversational and discourse analysis, it analyzes conversations between participants who watched a total of 56 slasher and slasher adjacent films over three months. What is shown is how an established genre, the slasher becomes reassembled and the performance of participating with the genre is demonstrated in the collected conversations. However, these conversations are expanded to the level of discourse and genre is shown to be encoded not only through statements, and on say, of what is said and unsaid, but through the statements of an embodied subject at the level of gesture. Ultimately, genre is shown to be gestural. This hopefully expands existing theories that, exa that examine genre at the level of content, characteristic or production, and ultimately concludes that genre is simultaneously recognized and embodied by an audience. However, before any methodological considerations are provided, there are two terms that require conceptualization in context of this work, namely genre and gesture. And it is such a good decision to take two terms that start the same way. So I apologize if I trip over them a little bit. As I am by no means a film scholar, my conceptualization of genre is literary in origin. So there may be some slight interstices between how I talk about the term 
and how it is more specifically used in film. So for this, I do apologize. But I follow, I follow Heather Dubrow, who exemplifies that genre functions much like a code of behavior established between the author and the reader, or in this case, to be somewhat reductionist, the film and the viewer. But I also acknowledge that genre is by no means deterministic in terms of film or literature, and is better understood as a tone of voice rather than a more clear cut signal. Ultimately, genre offers one interpretation of a text's meaning, directing our attention to the significant constituent elements, but it does not, and it cannot provide an infallible key to its meaning. For this reason, some researchers, such as John Froh, have defined genre as a discourse, with the word discourse being used in a pretty strictly Foucauldian sense. Not just a way of talking about something, or how something is spoken about, again, the said and unsaid, but rather genre as a series of practices that systematically and constituently form and mold the objects of which we speak. This complicates matters substantially. A genre as a concept therefore has a dual role when examining a text. Through definitions such as Dubrow and Frau's that I subscribe to, a film itself is a genre of meaning making in the same way that a novel, a chorus or a poem is a genre. However, within such modes exists genres inferred through these stylistic categories, romance, comedy, action, tragedy, and of course, the slasher. The last note I want to just quickly mention on genre, specifically regarding the notion of the genre film. Um, any examination of genre requires acknowledging that this term is often pejoratively used as a shorthand for formula. This definition often serves a broadly rhetorical purpose or a very, uh, sorry, um, I'm sorry, the broadly rhetorical purpose through which the capabilities and extensities of this mode can be reduced to nothing more than entertainment or a mass produced factory product devoid of personality. I take issue with genre defined in this way as it speaks to what to George Ritzer calls McDonaldization. I acknowledge that film can become heavily commodified, but genre's role in this discussion is not a point addressed in this paper. However, that being said, I do hope to show that such assertions are wholly false, not necessarily in the aesthetic boundaries of such films, but how the very act of watching, the gesture of watching, makes this impossible. My second term, gesture. I use the term gesture in the obsolete sense of to carry, to carry the body specifically from the Latin gerere, which means or translates to wield, bear or carry. Gesture is a deportment or a bearing of the body, a way in which an individual conducts, presents, or situates themselves. This is at odds with narrower and more generalized linguistic definitions of gesture, denoting the symbolic or signifying movement of the body, movements that include things like waves or shrugs of the shoulders or a thumbs up. To articulate this in a perhaps a different way, familiar to researchers working within critical theory, gesture is a framework for understanding the relationship between the subject and the apparatus or dispositif. The bearing of the subject within an apparatus requires a particular disposition on part of the individual. To be subject to something is to carry the expectations of an apparatus, to prepare for the correct methods of use, as Flusser would say. And this can only be done if the body is articulated and expressed in a particular way. It is for this reason that gesture can be understood as a method in which the subject acts themselves out, allowing for the dominant strategies of the apparatus to be endured and supported through a situatedness of the body. In becoming subject to an apparatus, a specific gesture is required by the individual and therefore the capacities of the body are reduced. What is imperative to understand is that the term gesture is a method for describing the relationship between subject and apparatus. Therefore, to say that a genre such as the slasher requires a specific gesture is to say that the slasher is a relationship through which an individual becomes slasher through how they situate themselves in terms of a series or collection or corpus of items. What this ultimately means is that the definition of genre as discourse pointed to above perhaps requires some expansion. expansion. And instead, genre is better understood as an apparatus. 
The methodological valency of this term allows for discursive considerations to be made, as well as accounting for various knowledges or literacies and any dominant strategies, power strategies implicit within its function. In short, a genre is not consolidated by the gesture of the body. Rather, the gesture of the body is required to create a genre, and therefore this genre becomes a constituent part of a subject. Some notes on method. This study is based on a corpus of WhatsApp text messages exchanged by means of an instant messaging application installed on smartphones. An internet connection is used to send text messages, photographs, animated GIFs and videos and audio files. The data was an ongoing conversation between two participants between July and October 2020. While the capabilities of WhatsApp allow for a variety of media to be exchanged, it is only the text that is analyzed here. The conversations were scraped from WhatsApp into a collection of text files using an API and some basic scripting. Each file was named in watch order and the file names included the title of the film and the year of release. The text files were stored in a secure cloud drive and a total of 14,672 texts were sent between the participants. However, there were very few discrete discussions on genre. So conversations were annotated with a variety of keywords to highlight points of interest. These keywords included horror, slasher, kill, death, genre, movie, and film. There were some these were some of the primary moments for qualitative discursive analysis. Since the text, of course, being text, does not have the same paralinguistic qualities as spoken conversation, other aspects of the text were considered in this analysis. Notably, things like frequency, capitalization, and time between messages. This also allowed for the gestural dynamics of the messages to be considered, as these qualities allowed for assumptions to be made in terms of inflection and intent. Furthermore, some considerations and allowances were made for the expected semantic field through various lexical devices. But what is important in terms of these methodological considerations is they allowed for a point of origin into a discussion on the slasher and the development of a literacy of the genre that became gesturally performed by the participants. My results. Ultimately, three themes were drawn from this analysis. They are namely, slasher literacy, real movie versus slasher, and the notion of the parameter of slasherness. The first notable development is that genre became tied through points of connection and points of separation in both thematic and stylistic elements, but also in terms of production. Clear markers of the genre became recognized and oftentimes message just referred to them. What was of note is that there appeared to be multiple strata of literacy, and in this, a particular vernacular was developed for talking about the genre, the slasher genre, but also specific franchises, Halloween, uh, the Friday series, Child's Play, and so on. This illustrated that the slasher genre was not only determined in terms of specific signs, but also in terms of the parameters and intensity of those signs across the conversation. Analyzing the conversations, you get the sense that the earlier films in the corpus were watched as, quote, films, and the disposition changed, and the later films were interrogated as slashes. However, it is difficult to indicate the exact moment this happens, as it seems to unfold gradually throughout the viewings. But some evidence of this can be seen in, the, sorry, some evidence of this can be seen in discussions surrounding various characters. For instance, the early child's play viewing focused more on Andy and the justification for his actions as seen in the conversations on the slide. However, during later viewings of series such as Friday the 13th, there were less discussions on the motivations of specific characters and rather discussions focused more on the salient recognizable elements of the genre and the franchise. For example, murdered teens and copious amounts of demonstration. While this could be a result of quality or writing of production, this is difficult to gauge, but it should be noted that this is where the second theme began to emerge very early in the viewing. The notion of the real or proper film as a comparison point to the slasher. This occurred surprisingly early and a distinction was drawn. For example, 
when 2013's Curse of Chucky was viewed, the participants referred to visual storytelling and cinematography. Two things worth noticing here. Firstly, that final statement, this is like a real movie. The distinction is clear between real movies, which are never defined by the participants and slashes. However, the referent to Brad somehow legitimates the full, sorry, legitimates the film as a slasher as he, the voice of Chucky, the killer doll, is all that matters, and it does. Another example can be seen during a discussion of I Know What You Did Last Summer that seems more like a movie than a straight slasher. But the genre was never completely defined, and instead it was often spoken about using various adjectives. These denoted what are called parameters of slasherness. For example, terms like unslashed, slashery, or slashed were used throughout the conversation. There was no complete slasher within the collection of films and the discussion surrounding them. Only differences of degree, not kind. These three themes showed how the participants came to understand the genre. Firstly, a literacy was developed made of both points of contact and points of separation. A distinction was made between slashers and real movies. And finally, the slasher itself became discussed in terms of parameter. But what makes this gestural? This is apparent in how responses to these films and expectations regarding them became repeated and shared across WhatsApp, grasped in the hands of the participants. It is, of course, nearly axiomatic within film studies to posit that the process of watching a film is performative. A film is no longer something one simply attends. As Francesco Cassetti reminds, the spectator has ceased simply to consume a show and begins to intervene in the act of consumption. They are asked not only to see, but also to do. This doing of the film occurs more and more in the hands of an increasingly mobile and networked culture as it invades the prehensile comprehension of an individual. Notably, during the pandemic, it can further be assumed that such a mode of viewing became not only common but requisite. The device or hold is not only a machine for WhatsApp. The device or hold is also a machine for Twitter, IMDb, Wikipedia, slasher wikis, and so on. This machine is a mobile screening device that is also predicated on what Heidi Ray Cooley refers to as fit. The hand is not just a structure that moves and interacts with the thing but it becomes a form of tactile media that extends the body of the film beyond the virulent and excessive blood splatter on the screen. This leads to a discussion into how this performance can be understood as mixed media. To declare a medium as mixture in this regard refers to how all media is encountered through a sensory modality insofar as perception is also always synesthetic and synoptic meaning our senses are modalities of perception and as such cooperative and commutable. This allows for the doing of watching a film with a phone to be considered in terms of tactile media. Ultimately, as van der Strauven writes, this implies the potential of being touched, of being perceived by the sense of touch, or even, be, or even better, of being involved in a concrete act of touching. Ultimately, a novel volume of relations is created between a film, the viewers, the device, and the virtual network implicit within the device's functionality. This convergence does not only occur following the film's viewing, but is also during the process of watching or doing the film. The genre of the slasher, as understood by the participants of this study, is informed gesturally through the film, the hands, and this novel relations that includes all of them. I need to begin wrapping up. I have a distinct advantage of being one of the last papers of a three-day conference on this subject. So I have a certain vantage point over what has already been said. And from this position, it is apparent that the slasher is a genre of bodies. However, I use the term body not in the sense of the human body, but in a more gestural sense, the body as an assemblage or an individuation of relations. The slasher as a genre fetters various relations together. Bodies of race, bodies of gender, bodies of urban or rural or digital spaces, all presented and represented as film. 
how these bodies are tied as genre is expressed in another quote I borrow from Debra. Almost all poetic forms have predilections for certain prosodoic patterns, just as almost all human beings have some urge to aggression. But the extent to which such tendencies are realized and their role in the total pattern of the psyche is formed of the form in question varies tremendously. The slasher and its specific variation has become increasingly more apparent over the weekend and simultaneously more discreet and tenuous. But it is almost beyond questioning to say that the discussion of genre is always a discussion from the position of a gesturing subject. Specifically, specifically in terms of my study, to conclude, while slasher literacy was certainly developed online by the participants, the other themes were not. The distinction between real films and slashes or parameters of slasherness were developed gesturally through this process of watching, discussing, and performing these films. Ultimately, the genre becomes an arranging of bodies tactically arranged by bodies, and the final definition of the slasher is never complete nor even an effective ontological category for these films. The slasher was nothing more than a means of doing films as an audience through their hands. Hands luckily not yet amputated and held off the side of the boat. Thank you. Thank you so much for that, Darren. It was really, really spectacular. I like that. Throw it over the shoulder, it's over now. Um, so what, what I think is really spectacular about having these two papers back to back is this kind of politics of the temporal and the spatial. I think it's uh, really, really prominent. Um, and also this idea of machinery that I you wouldn't instantly think were connected to one another in terms of your papers, but actually, um, yeah, that notion of machinery is really interesting. Also, um, I will ask a question in a second, but to Darren, um, you said that one of your participants thought that Andy was going to be the killer and they started kind of, shall I say, gesturing to one another. <laughs> I think it's really funny because, um, the uh, gay screen, well, should have been gay screenwriter, uh, Don Mancini. He, in fact, I think he did write it in the end, but uh, initially he was gonna make uh, Andy and Chucky were going to be like a killing double act. So I think it's quite interesting how kind of, even though that never became the actual script because MGM had an issue with it, I think it's kind of cool that people are still getting that original creativity. But. To, to, not turn this, to not turn this into a, into a Chucky conversation, which tends I know, to- I'm not going to, I promise. Well, it's but queer horror and that's related, am I right? Yeah, I mean, Dan Mancini took more control over the series as it went on and the, the movies became better for it, um, we found. And I mean, the new series, I mean, the, at the center of that series is a young queer couple and the dolls coming back. So I'm sure it's gonna be, I'm very excited. But again, off topic, I apologize. Don't get me started, please, or else I'll talk about that killer doll for the rest of my life. <laughs> um, please do so. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, my name is so I have a question for Tucci. Um, were you here yesterday for Eric Brinkman's talk on the final girl? I'm curious to know. I think I was, I think I was, yes. Um, so Eric ended up in the end talking about how the final girl has fundamentally evolved to embody this neoliberalism you know we've kind of gone from a, the victimized uh victim hero to being neoliberal and i feel like the neoliberalism is very much in the definition of gender and whilst your paper touches on gender uh without it touches on gender without actually touching on gender i think it's really interesting how um your theoretical framework's actually quite radically against neoliberalism, whilst we're simultaneously saying, I'm hey, neoliberal final girl. <laughs> For me, Tree is a revolutionary, like revolutionist. Uh, but yeah, I, I now that you talked about it, because uh, in these three days, we like listen to so many talks and sometimes they get jumbled up. But uh, now that you talked about neoliberalism, liberalism and i remembered uh eric eric's talk and uh yeah i was while i was listening to it, i was like i am saying the complete opposite of this like mm -hmm. this is not 
Uh, it's not the same. There, uh, but of course, th there are ways to look at something. Like there are multiple ways to look at something. Of course, uh, we do do not have to do the you know same thing over and over again. <laughs> like just mm -hmm. like Happy Death Day. Um, but um, I do believe that it is a revolutionary film more than uh, more than neoliberal. I think it, I completely agree. I think as well going via the notion of trauma is actually really uh, useful, especially in terms of the fact that it, you know, it, it's always difficult to decipher whether someone's talking about gendered trauma or someone's talking about trauma in a much yeah. larger sense. However, I'm commenting and not actually asking any questions, ironically. Um, a question. You know, you know I, I love uh, talking about grief because my dissertation was on grief. <laughs> I try to <laughs> like divert the topic to grief at any given moment, so well, yeah. I mean, just just to on. jump in, just to jump in briefly there with ha with Happy Death Day. That was kind of one of the films that really drew that distinction with our conversations, with these conversations mm -hmm. between a slasher. Because the first one is more kind of a traditional slasher, and the mm -hmm. second one is like you know time travel weirdness, sci-fi and sci-fi. It's sci-fi. I mean, <laughs> wonderful, wonderful. But you you could start to see that kind of distinction come straight up there, and it was. Yeah, what a series. What a exactly. series. Anyway. That's why I loved it, because it just took the idea. When I first heard that they were going to do a sequel, I was like, why? But then I watched it and I said, oh, my God, they completely changed the entire concept. And uh, while staying true to the original, and it was perfect. To me, mm. it was perfect. I can't. <laughs> I can find a fault in Happy That Day franchise. I can't. There isn't fault. That's the exact reason why. Um, so we have a question in the comment section that I think is um, really interesting in relation to kind of historical horror studies theory. So we have a question for Darren that says, further into the watch list, did you find the participants cheering for the killers? I've noticed this happen with franchises as they go on. Um, yeah, that's that's actually a, an interesting an interesting uh, question. Thanks, Cam. Um, but I think it was it depended on the series itself. In many ways, we found ourselves cheering for a franchise more than kind of a, a specific killer or specific figure. So, for example, I mean, you know, we the Halloween wasn't for us. Like it was by the twenty seventh movie in that series. It's just like just that's enough. You know, I've had enough. But I think that I mean, if this if if there was a quality to the franchise itself, it kind of motivated us. And I mean, yeah, they were at the end of it. I mean, you're you're cheering for Chucky, and you're like this this character is a monster. Like you know, like, <laughs> characters like like it's the morally reprehensible thing. You know. Um, and but I think I think that did I mean I'll have to go through the through the the corpus again and I think it would be interesting for me to look at it again and say okay when did we start cheering for Jason and what which film was it and how mm -hmm. does that relate to how we felt about the film but um, I know there was a there was a fantastic paper yesterday on Freddy Krueger which was which was interestingly a series we want we wanted to love Nightmare we really wanted to love Nightmare on Elm Street and I think Nightmare Five was probably one of the, the highlight viewing points of the whole series. But it's like, after a while, Freddy just kind of became annoying, <laughs> you know? And then all of a sudden, it's like, I've had enough, you know? I, I don't want to cheer for Mickey Mouse, you know? It's like, I've had enough of it. So, yeah. This kind of explicitly then comes into another question that we have um, in which um, I will, it's for Darren, but I will then relate it directly to Tucci. So um, after talking about the killers, um, someone has asked, uh, except I've just forgotten where it is. Here we go. Uh, question for Darren. Did the participants demonstrate empathy towards characters or regard the characters as deserving of their grisly fate? That's, you know what, that's actually a lovely question. And before I cut, before I cut my, um, my paper down for time, it, I actually had a paragraph on it. Um, it became too much about a paper about empathy itself, but that distinction between a real movie and a slasher film is once viewed as a real movie, then you want to develop that kind of classic cinema empathy with the character on. Mm. You know, you situate yourselves in that character. But when it's a slasher, then it's like, I don't care. Like, you know, let's see someone get, I want to see someone thrown out of a window and get hit by a bus <laughs> and fly into a tree and I want to see their head fly off. And then that's when kind of you, you realize that it's, 
you know, it's people as props type of problem, which again, massively problem massively problematic in in the viewing but um also that's what made it so interesting for me is how kind of gestural and responsive these these things came mm. it wasn't sort of like a considered thing and saying you know what i don't really care about nancy anymore let's let's hope she gets decapitated it says oh this one's the slasher friday let's let's see how these characters get fucked up you know so i think that's kind of that that was kind of the, the distinction so it became a genre thing in many ways mm. so yeah um i have to wrap up Weird. Sorry to interrupt. No, it's fine. So weird yeah. because happy that they starts with Tree as an anti-hero. She's mm. she's the girl you love to hate uh, at <laughs> college, and then you try to understand her. That then you start to understand her. You started to see her trauma and how she's not dealing with it healthily. And yeah. uh, you're tr you're starting to empathize then, Absolutely. and you're tr feeling empathy toward the character in a slasher, and you're yeah. like, no, I don't want her to die. She's going through a lot. <laughs> she no, needs to fix her shit. <laughs> it's, yeah, it's from, that, from that lovely paper yesterday, it becomes a kind of meta modern slasher. You know, it's not just a mm -hmm. postmodern kind of throw away of the genre, but a. You know, it's like all of a sudden you, you start Happy Death and you're like, this this character's a little annoying. You know, it's like, <laughs> after a while, you're like, no, 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 please, please be okay, you know? So. True, well, true. I, ironically, Tucci answered my question without me even having to ask the question. So, you know, temporal moments, synergy. <laughs> I saw the future. <laughs> <laughs> um, unfortunately, we have hit uh, nine o'clock. Um, so we're gonna have to wrap up, but again, we've just had two absolutely fantastic papers. Darren and Tucci, thank you so much. They were thoroughly enjoyable. Um, both Darren and Tucci are on Twitter, um, if you would care to find them, <laughs> because <laughs> I, I would I would put the Twitter in, but I'm sharing. I, so. I don't know. I will, I will put my Twitter in, in the chat. Smart. Yeah. Thank you. I will go. I'll, I'll go figure out what what I called myself when I was sixteen and put it in the chat <laughs> and apologize profusely to everyone. <laughs> okay. Thank you so much, you two. Uh, thanks. Thanks for being a lovely chair, Daniel. Speak soon. Thank you.